Hello and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode will be an interview with Ngugi Wationgo, who is Distinguished Professor of Comparative Literature and English at the University of California, Irvine. Hi, Professor Ngugi. Hi, how are you? I'm great. It's a great honor to have you on this episode and on the podcast. Let's say to G.K. Jeffers, he did a great book on philosophy in African languages. He did. And I'll tell him you said I, so. <laughs> I think it's really among the very first, probably the only one. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It is a great pleasure and privilege to have you on the series. You've written a lot, and you've written in numerous genres. You've written novels, you've written plays, you've written essays, you've even written film scripts. And so the first thing we wanted to ask is how you see the philosophical aspects of your work as being expressed in different kinds of writing. So do you think of one particular form of writing as being particularly well-suited to express philosophical ideas, for example? Well, the first question is, What's philosophy, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, wisdom, it's such a wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. As I was saying, philosophy is rooted in origin. At least the Greek philosophy is rooted in origin, remember. Yeah. That's why the dialogues of Plato's dialogues, so uh, Socratic dialogues, everyone more or less begins with somebody is coming from the market, they go by somebody's house, they ask to enter the house, they are welcomed, and they sit down, a topic arises, uh, about beauty or about God, or about, and there a dialogue begins, okay? So philosophy is rooted in the very ordinary, and philosophy is rooted in origin, okay, in conversation, right? Yes, yeah, so I would argue, that literature, whether mine or Shakespeare, is actually also has philosophical dimensions as well. And do you think that writing can capture philosophy as well as live conversation? Yeah, depends, again, depends on how we define philosophy. If you search for wisdom, if you seeing connection between the form of phenomena, if you asking questions, about patriotism or whatever. A lot of literature does ask those questions or by implication, yeah. So I will not just say just me, you know, but writers like Chinua Achebe, for instance, things fall apart. I've seen the work quoted by philosophers, politicians, religious people, and that kind of thing, things fall apart. And I believe some of my books Particularly, I would say the ones which are fiction, like Petals of Blood you know, or Wizard of the Crow, which I wrote in Gikoyo, in my mother tongue, they ask questions about everything, about love, politics, relationships, and so on. It's only they don't use the current language of philosophy in the sense that they don't use the language of philosophy, they just call it the I don't mean to be derogative, but you don't see the jargon of philosophy, but they ask similar questions and then they explore those. You just mentioned Achebe, and we can say that you know, throughout your works, you refer to a lot of other Africana authors in literature and philosophy. So just to name a few names, C.L.R. James, Franz Fanon, Eric Williams, mm. and Walter Rodney. Actually, you recently wrote a foreword for a collection of writings by Walter Rodney. And we were wondering if you wanted to just pick out one or two thinkers who have been particularly influential on you. The question is about development, you know, very, very important. It's where the whole relation between Africa and the West, you know, and the title of his book actually is very important, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. It's kind of, the very title negates the whole idea of colonial assumptions of having brought development to the continent, of having brought technology or whatever to the continent. They said, no, no, on the contrary, what they brought under development, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, right? Francois Fanon 
of course, I mean, very influential, you know, in African thought, whether, you know, professional philosophy or literature or politics, right? How did Fanon for it affect me? I can tell you because it's very important to me. Because I wrote my first two novels of Weep No Child and The River Between before I read Fanon. And then I came to Leeds. I was also a journalist in Kenya for a long time and even wrote a column. I was called The Nation and I had a column uh, called As I See It, which is self of fairly philosophical in the sense, you see how you see things. Anyway, so I can't really, I was born in a colonial situation. Kenya was a settler colony. And we saw things in Kenya at the time in terms of black and white oppression was white oppressor, black oppressed, okay? Everything, in, in other words, black and white explained political reality because you talk about poverty and wealth, white was wealth, black was poverty. You talk about power, white was power, black was, uh, right? So, we get independence, or rather we regain our independence in 1963 in Kenya, say. Now, questions arise. We see things in terms of black and white. In fact, we're seeing Kenya, the Europeans would say Kenya, white highlands, or white man's country. And we would sing, or liberation movement would sing, Kenya is a black people's country counter, black and explain it, and fairly accurately. <laughs> After independence, you see, wait a minute, same things are happening. True, there are now a few rich Africans, but really the majority are in the same situation. What, how do you explain this? Uh, how you can't explain it purely in terms of black and white. <laughs> You know, it doesn't give you the answers. And it's Fanon who opened, this my eyes, and it's where the rest of the earth. It's where this chapter, page four of national consciousness, who be to see, who explained, I began to see this, not so much in black and white, but in social terms, class terms, that's a working class and a middle class and that kind of thing and imperialism, and that helped me to shape my writing thereafter, you know. By the time I came to write my A Grain of Wheat, I had read Fanon, or Petals of Blood. So Fanon really influenced me a lot. He was a thinker, philosopher, yes, actually. That's really interesting. Sort of tempted to ask you more about Fanon. No, he influenced many, many people, really. He was... His book, The Rachel of the Art, has been very impactful. Uh, since the Agaremba of Zimbabwe, you know, the title of our book, Nervous Conditions, is taken directly from, from Fanon. Mm -hmm. The very title of the novel is from Fanon. Well, I should ask you something about your own writings, and maybe I'll start with something that you just mentioned a few minutes ago, which is the decision you made to write in Gipuyu. And this is something that obviously is a political choice. So you're pushing back against the dominance of English as a world language, a language that was spread by colonialism. Can you tell us about that decision and maybe talk more about why you decided to start writing in your native language? Yeah. In fact, talking of course, books of philosophy, I would put, you put probably the colon in the mind as a philosophical work. Uh, in the book I wrote in 1964, and there were a series of lectures I gave in Auckland University in honor of their first chancellor, Rob. They called Rob and Lectures. I was asked to speak on the question of language in African literature or something like that. And this is a book which became the colonized the mind. And these are some of the thoughts I had when I was imprisoned in Kenya, committing maximum security prison as a result of or because of a play, Gai Kadeda, a mother 
when I want, which we with Go and Marie, we wrote in Gikoyo, my mother tongue, and was performed by literally small farmers and working people, factory workers, plantation workers. And it was stopped by the Kenyan government in 1977, November, December, the same year, I was put in Kamet Maklum security prison. So when there, I started asking myself, why? Why would the Kenyan government, an African government, put me in prison for writing in an African language? It's a very painful question. Why? It doesn't make sense to me. Why? Because I've written other plays in English, which are as critical of the government or as critical of the post-colonial conditions in Kenya. And really, I was never put in prison beyond police questioning here and there. That's when I really started thinking about the language question seriously. And I, I look at it this way. In all colonial conditions, or in all conditions of the oppressor oppressed, language has always been used as a means fulfilling the desires of oppression. And I've got good examples of this. Let me start with Africa. We, the children, were often given corporal punishment, beaten even, or humiliated in every possible way. When you were caught speaking mother tongues in a school compound. Really? But then I found the same thing happened. Let's start with Wales. Wales. Wales kids were taught were humiliated in the same way. They carry something called Welsh not. If they were speaking Welsh in school compound. It happened in Ireland. It happened about Native Americans. They were humiliated in every possible way. They were given European names, uh, languages. It happened in New Zealand. They were beaten, Maori were beaten in the same way. All over, the same story. French colonies, what you call it, the same pattern. Punished people for their mother tongues, but glorified them in a form uh, when they speak the colonial language as well. Why is that? The question arises. If I know my mother tongue and add English to it or French, what's wrong with that? I'm more powerful. I know my mother tongue, but I also add English to it or French, right? But it was the colonial education wasn't like that. It was it's a negation of African languages. It was built on negation. The knowledge of English was built on the negation of African languages. Everywhere. And negation of Maori uh, languages, Native American languages, Native Canadian languages, Native Australian languages, okay? Now, compare this. If an Englishman goes to France to study French, they don't punish him for his English. They will teach him French to add to the English he has. Or the other way around. A Frenchman can go to Oxford to study English. That's normal. So the colonial situation language was an abnormal situation. It had to do with colonialism of the mind. Tying, making a bond between the colonized and the language of the colonizer. They did see themselves as outsiders. They associate the language with non-development, with humiliation, with negativity. So you create a class, an elite, an, a European language speaking elite, ruling <laughs> a country of African language speakers. 
This is what I call colonizing the mind. And so I wrote a book called Colonizing the Mind. Unfortunately, the situation has been normalized now in independent Africa. In Africa, I call it normalized abnormality, right? Yeah. Normal abnormality of the colonial system. Because even at that call, it was abnormal to make a child, to humiliate a child for mother tongue instead of adding to that language. So they know many languages. No, you have to make them deny their languages in order to master into languages. Continue with that abnormality, which is now normalized. So what we had the post-colonial situation in Africa, in most places, is normalized abnormality. And that question of normal abnormality has not been addressed all over the world. No, not yet. Shall I give an example of normalized abnormality? Yeah, absolutely. Please. Okay, let me give an example. And I'll begin with here where I got refuge in America, and I'm very grateful. I got refuge here. I got a job here. As you say, I'm a distinguished professor of uh, comparative literature and English. I had three prof- professorships in, in New York University for 10 years. Professor of, of, of studies, of comparative literature, and at Another one on languages, honorary one. Now, in a sense, I was forced out of my own country. I'm grateful I, that I got an opportunity here. But at the same time, this does not make from and asking myself, what is America? The one which intrigues me a lot is the question of American independence. And I said, what is American independence? What's Canadian independence? What's New Zealand independence? Weren't there colonizers here? Yeah. America was a settler colony. Means some people from Europe came to America and colonized people who owned America, what we call Native Americans. So decolonization would mean that the people who were colonized now become free. But no, it's a settler community, it's a colonizing community who declared themselves independent. It's what they call American independence. So you can see even America is a normalized abnormality. The same with Canada, the same with Australia, New Zealand normalized abnormality because Native Americans have never gone through not being colonized. They never went through the process, that process, or Native Canadians, or Native New Zealanders, or Australians. Kenya, I can very proud of Kenya because Kenya was a center colony, but it was the first to defy that trend which had been there of settler colonies declaring themselves independent, meaning they continue to colonize the people, they normalized the, the colonization. So to be very frank, we live in a world of normalized, rooted in normal abnormality. And the many things in the world going on today, wars in Iraq, Kilio Gaddafi, other things like that, are really Afghanistan for 20 years, Vietnam, I mean, and other wars. You can see they are rooted on the assumptions, but it's normal abnormality that's ruling the world, right? I ask you kind of a small question, but something that Chika and I were curious about is that in Decolonizing the Mind, the book you just mentioned, you actually talk about writing in Gikuyu, but also in Swahili. And uh-huh. you've written quite a lot in Gikuyu, but have you thought about writing more in Swahili as well? No, 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 no. My Swahili is not very good, but I really would like love to. But the fundamental question is, is you know, Swahili is a genuinely an African language, mm. like Gikuyu, like any other African language, okay? But it is this other dimension that's a language that is known in, uh, by many other communities. Swahili 
is an African language, which also happens to be widely known in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Uganda, in the Congo, that kind of thing. It's a very good language for linking and enabling conversation among African languages. African language as a whole, ni kudu kiswahili, need to develop. We can base all the language on the knowledge of our mother tongue, whatever it is, all over the world. I don't believe in this nonsense they have, that you must have one. You can have a national language which enables conversation among the different language communities. But that should not be negation of their mother tongue. The history, the philosophy, millions of years of thought that they have gone to make that language. And as a stroke of a pen, you say it does not exist. It's the same as, as ban libraries. You say, you go to ban libraries, people say, oh, don't do that. This is horrible. But it's exactly the same thing when you suppress the other languages. And I don't believe in the hierarchy of languages. I know all languages should have equal give and take on this equality, like conversation among languages. But there's nothing wrong if you know another language that enables you to talk across those other languages. This is where I put it, and I repeat it here. If you know all the languages of the world, and I mean all, and you don't know your mother tongue or the language of your culture, that is enslavement. But if you know your mother tongue or the language of your culture and add to it all the language of the world, that's empowerment. In other words, English is a very good language. So it's French. But so also is Mandarin and Russian. But so also is Zulu, Yoruba, Ikoyo, Luo, Swahili. So what words, even if you have an African language, as spoken across the continent. It should be on a hierarchical basis. It should be built on the negation of the other languages. But it can be used. It's very useful. It's very important that I can go to Tanzania and speak Swahili or other parts of Kenya and speak Swahili. But I'm glad that when I come to America, I can speak English. I went to Japan once and I couldn't follow any I mean, the first time I went to Japan, and I don't have any Japanese me. So whenever I had an English person speak, whoever it is, I would gravitate towards them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's wrong in language is a hierarchy of languages, not language per se. I think what you were just saying leads to a, a, an issue that we noticed in your writing as well. So something that we've talked about a lot in the podcast is it seems like there's this tension between thinkers who want to celebrate a particular culture or maybe a particular language, right? And think about philosophical ideas that could perhaps only be expressed within that particular culture. And then the mm. idea that philosophy should be getting at universal values or universal truths, right? But it seems like you're saying that you sort of start from a particular place and then you, through this conversation with other peoples, you get to something universal. Universality comes from particularity. Universality is not an abstract. It has abstractions. It's, it's, it's rooted in particularity. But universal is inherent in a particular. Okay, we are all human beings. We are human beings, you and I. Eh? But I'm black. You are white, right? That's a particularity of you. That's a particularity of me, right? But we are human. Human is a universality. It's a human, universal. Whether you come from China or whatever, <laughs> but that humanity is not expressed in a, an abstract universality. <laughs> it explains particularity of Bogi, a Giko speaker, a Chebe, Igbo speaker, uh, or Shakespeare, English speaker, and so on. You're interested in James Baldwin and Shakespeare, right? Because you mentioned that in there's this other book you wrote called Global Lectics. You talk about James Baldwin and, and Shakespeare when you're explaining the title, isn't that right? Yeah, I like their works a lot. In fact, 
you know, the irony is that in a way, the moment I embraced it, called my mother tongue, I came to appreciate Shakespeare more because I could see what she was going through. Or with the French writer, who wrote, is it a blade? I can't remember the French writer who wrote uh, pan, a two car of Pantagruel. Rabelais, yeah. The big throw. Rabelais, yeah. Uh, what, what's the writer? Rabelais, yeah, that's right. And Rabelais, yeah. yeah I, I covered him in the podcast, that's why I know. <laughs> yeah, because I could see how they were, they were discovering their languages. You know, English was emerging from Latin domination, and uh, so was French, many Western English languages. They were, they were emerging out of uh, Latin hegemony previously. So many of the writers, including Dante, the excitement you seem to have and the originality comes from discovery of their languages anew. So that you can see them, they're very wordy. It is very wordy in some cases. Because he's enjoying seeing what he can say this thing in English in this way and that way. The same with Rabelais, all of them, they play with their languages, which they have discovered and knew its beauties, possibilities. So actually, let me ask you a question about that as well, because so you're a writer of fiction, you've written literature, Rabelais, Shakespeare, great writers of literature. And on the other hand, you're also someone who's very interested in political issues. And you clearly believe in the power of culture, like literature in political life, not just literature, but culture in general. So that in some point you say that culture is not like a, an accidental growth. It's not like a sixth finger, but it's more like the flower of a plant, which is something I like a lot. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. So can you say something more about that? Like the sort of the power of culture to change things? I look at a tree or a plant. When you see a plant, we admire beauty. I mean, and the beauty we admire really is actually the flower express the beauty of a tree, more or less, you know. That's all, right? But then you look at it carefully, and you say, first of all, the flower does not just emerge. It's part of the tree growing or a plant. Then it gets flowers. Beautiful. So the flower expresses the totality, the being of that tree. But it's also important because the flower carries the seeds, the future of that tree, that plant. So I compare culture to that kind of flower. In a sense, it arises from the totality of the being of that community, but it carries the seeds of the tomorrow of that community, the memory, if you like. So for me, culture is not something which is static any more than a flower is static because the flower carries the past and the future of that plant, isn't it? Because it is a result of the past of that community from the seed, the growing, and then flower. But then, same flower, beautiful, wonderful, it has a seed for tomorrow. If a plant produced flower and no seeds of tomorrow, we would feel a little bit of its future and we know what kind of plant is that one. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And what would you say to someone who's skeptical about the power of something like a novel or a play to change political life? No, the novel is, in general, just the novel, just for the arts in general, with to link art to the imagination. And the human is impossible without imagination. What's a human being without imagination? Then he's like, I suppose a lion or whatever, <laughs> you'll be no different than any other animals of nature. But imagination is the one thing, because in imagination, we can build pictures of tomorrow. Look at architects, for instance. They imagine a house in the head. They see it, and then they build it. We imagine things and then realize them. So imagination one possibilities. And what the books do on the arts are products of that imagination, but they also feed that imagination. That's why in all communities, children are brought up with stories of all our impossible beings, of angels with wings, of God. You imagine them. And then some try to realize them in fact. What is that enriches that imagination? It's the arts. 
stories, you know, novels, and then you enrich the imagination. But that imagination is the one which enables discoveries, inventions, all the possibilities we have. We have the human. So the arts are not something which is secondary to our being. It's central to our being. And I suspect one of the reasons why many authoritarian regimes go for the arts is to limit the imagination. And you can see this is happening in America. Now they are banning books in America. Certain books are not allowed in America. And so they talk about black history, or they talk about slavery, at least in Florida, America. What's that mean? They are functioning in the same way as all totalitarian regimes do. And they do it to limit imagination, because it enables us to see the possible worlds. We see different worlds, alternative worlds. That's how human societies have developed. And the arts are part of that imagination. Okay, they are products of imagination, but they are also, to put it very simply, the food that nourishes the imagination of the people. Just the body needs food. We eat food, function physically. Imagine also needs the art. But then, is that, yeah, so, and you, why is it same pattern all over the world that totalitarian regimes go for the arts? They imprison writers all over in history. Writers, artists are in prison or exiled. Why? What you call in the Bible, the biblical prophets were writers, but instead of writing, they spoke out the words. They had visions. Ezekiel in the Valley of Bones, bring the life to the bones and all that. Today we call them writers, only they don't write this book, their words, their visions. They could see the ages ahead, all the possibilities, and they spoke to them. Revelations, all sorts of things. But what they're doing in Florida, in America, you cannot believe it. They are burning books. I mean, how oh, is, and it does, can't even read the history <laughs> of totalitarianism and books. And they are doing the same one. It actually brings me to the last thing I wanted to ask you, because, I mean, obviously you've been around for a while and you've worked in American universities and your works are on reading lists at universities in America and all over the world. Do you have an optimistic attitude about the way things are going? I mean, people talk about decolonialization all the time now or decolonizing the curriculum, for example, at universities. Do you see a lot of progress being made or? You know, I think it's good. You know, life is trouble, right? <laughs> yeah. No matter how we look at it, to walk, walking alone is a struggle between stopping and moving forward. You know, one leg has to be anchored to the ground stationary to allow the other leg the left leg to go forward. Then the other one stops. And because it stops, the, the other leg can move forward. Huh? <laughs> Imagine a world which was completely oiled so that the, like, no leg can, you know, they, you can't move, okay? Moving is always a struggle. I mean, this has been said by Hegel and others. I'm not saying say for the first time, the struggle of opposites, darkness and light. Everything is a struggle, okay? Growth itself, you and I, we've been talking for the last two minutes or half an hour. Are we the same people who we start talking in terms of cells in our body? Some have been dying and others have been born. Blood has been circulating through our, when we talk of high blood pressure, is when the blood moves harder <laughs> more than it should, you know? But it means there's a struggle going on in our bodies, in our cells, in the way we walk. I mean, the struggle, the struggle is always there. And there's no human without struggle. When we don't struggle, we die, <laughs> right? Isn't it? So maybe it's not so important how things are going. The main thing is to keep moving in the right direction. Yeah, we, mo- we struggle. There's always, even no matter how conditional there's struggle between the one that looks f- forces that creating a tomorrow and for the pulling us backwards. 
And that's how it has to be there. It is there. Even today, it's there in America. You can see it. It's there in Kenya. It's there in Russia, in China, in India. The struggle between the today and first for tomorrow. All right. Well, I guess that's a pretty inspiring, but also maybe sobering note to end on. Uh, so, uh, and Boogie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm sorry. My philosophy is very ordinary language, yeah? Of what happens every day. I'm fascinated by the every day, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Right. Okay. So thanks for listening. I guess we don't necessarily have anything that exciting to offer you in the next episode as an interview with Ngugi Watsyongo, but I think it'll be pretty exciting nonetheless. I say hi to my hero, GK. Okay, <laughs> okay I'll tell him that. <laughs> Please join us next right? time for more of the history of Africana philosophy. Mm-hmm.